What is up, everybody? Welcome into an all-new episode of the Pack-A-Day Podcast. I am your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. Thanks for being here today. What a huge episode this is. The Packers find their new defensive coordinator, Jeff Halfley, head coach out of Boston College, which none of us, not you, not me, not anyone saw coming. An absolutely out of nowhere hire for Matt LaFleur. It does go to show you just how secretive they're able to keep some things in Green Bay, which I'm sure we're going to discuss a little bit. But There is so much to get to with this conversation. We're going to talk about what he brings to the table, his background, and we're going to really go through this in a very similar process to all the other defensive coordinator interview candidates and deep dives that we've done so far. If you've been following along, we really went into all these different candidates and what they bring. I wanted to do it in a very similar way today because even though as I went through it, I knew that he's the defensive coordinator rather than thinking he could be the defensive coordinator like I did with the other candidates. I wanted to use the same process so A, we can kind of compare and contrast, but B, so I could kind of go into this and try to you know not have rose-tinted glasses and say, all right, well, let me look at this from a positive standpoint because he is the Packers defensive coordinator. I wanted to use sort of the same process that I went through with all the other ones before knowing who the head or the defensive coordinator was. So that's what we're going to do today. We'll take a deep dive into his experience, what it means for the Packers. We'll break everything down and guess what? Guess what? We also have a special guest in a little bit, Dusty Evely, who, of course, as everyone else was looking for all the different information on Jeff Halfley, he just jumps into the tape right away and goes to the Boston College film and immediately starts breaking it down. So I wanted to talk to him about what he saw on tape. So we'll have that discussion for you in just a little bit. But let's start right away. Jeff Halfley, 44 years old. And guess what? For those of you who saw the immediate tweets that were out there of, oh, he's best friends with Matt LaFleur. That's why he got hired. That He doesn't hire outside of his circle of friends. Like he just wants his buddies. First of all, first of all, his last hire, Rich Basaccia, not in his friend group at all. Not even remotely. That was like something totally separate. And he brought in what who he thought was the most qualified special teams coordinator for the job. So it's not like he's just hired, you know, buddy system style. That's a Macho Man Randy Savage reference, by the way. But uh, like three of you are going to get that. Uh, But anyway, uh, it's not like he just, you know, goes with his friends. And he has done a little bit of that in the past. I get it. But this does not seem like that. Now, he has been in similar coaching circles as Kyle Shanahan. He's coached with Adam Stenovich and Ryan Downard. We'll talk about that. But these coaching circles are so freaking tight. There's just not a lot of width and depth to the NFL coaching sphere. And of course, you're going to have intersecting paths. And of course, you're going to talk to different coaches that you know to get recommendations. But this absolutely feels like a merit-based hire, not anything that is just because he was friends with Matt LaFleur. So we can, I think, hopefully put that little sidebar to rest immediately. But this is his resume. Started as a coach in 2001, was a running backs coach for WPI, was a defensive assistant for Albany and then a defensive backs coach with Albany, a defensive assistant for Pitt, a defensive backs coach for Pitt, a defensive backs coach for Rutgers, an assistant defensive backs coach for the Buccaneers, followed by defensive backs coach for the Buccaneers, uh, defensive backs coach for the Browns, and then same title with the 49ers. Then he went to Ohio State for one season as co-defensive coordinator and defensive backs coach, and then was hired at Boston College as their new head coach. Well, at least he was new when he got hired. He has a ton of influences in his background. He has worked under Robert Sala, which I'm sure is very uh, enticing to Matt LaFleur. He has worked under Mike Pettin. He has worked under Greg Schiano. He has worked with D'Amico Ryans. He has worked with Ryan Day. And you might say, Andy, Ryan Day is not a defensive coach. We'll talk about that. He's worked with Kyle Shanahan. Same thing. Kyle Shanahan, not a defensive coach. Working with people like Kyle Shanahan and Ryan Day and Bobby Babich and Aaron Glenn and Bobby Slowick and D'Amico Ryans and Robert Sala, you pick up on things regardless if you're working with them on the offensive side of the ball or the defensive side of the ball. He has worked with some incredible coaches. Now, his defensive influences are going to come more from Robert Sala, Mike Pettin, and Greg Schiano. Again, D'Amico Ryans was not in like a you know, formal defensive coordinator type position when they work together, but you can still pick, you know, some ideas from his brain. But Ryan Day, Kyle Shanahan, just even working with those type of coaches, you're going to take away a lot of how to become a coach. And that's exactly what he took to Boston College and use some of that, um, you know, knowledge and experiences to, to guide him along the way as he became a head coach. 
He, when he was a assistant defensive backs coach in Cleveland, excuse me, when he was defensive backs coach in Cleveland, his assistant defensive backs coaches were Aaron Glenn, defensive coordinator in Detroit, and Bobby Babich. So again, new defensive coordinator with Buffalo. He's also worked with Mike LaFleur. He's worked with Adam Stenovich, Ryan Downard. So I'm sure Matt LaFleur was able to bounce some of those ideas off of some of those people that he's worked with and to try to get a better understanding here for who Jeff Halfley actually is. So yes, there is some common connections there. I think the thing you love here is there's a wide breadth of you know different coaching experiences that he's had under defensive influences. I mean, Robert Sala, Mike Pett, and Greg Schiano, all a little bit different. He's run 3-4 schemes or been a part of teams that have run 3-4. He's been part of teams that have run 4-3 and have had all different styles. His scheme at Boston College was a 4-3 scheme. Let's just get this piece of it out of the way right away. I would not assume that because he ran a 4-3 at Boston College, that means he wants to run a 4-3 in Green Bay. And we have talked about this all week. Whether it's a 4-3 or a 3-4, he will be a nickel 80% of the time-ish anyway. There will be some dime. There will be some goal line. There are very few snaps anymore in a true 3-4 or 4-3 defense. There will be some. Guess what? Green Bay ran some 4-3 defense at the end of this season. Did you notice? Did you care? Probably not. But they ran some legitimate pure 4-3 at the end of this year. Who cares? It doesn't matter because there's so few snaps that you actually play base defense that you're not even going to remotely recognize it. There could be a difference in how he has his edge players. Maybe he has their hand in the ground. Maybe he has them standing up still. But I wouldn't assume anything at this point because he has backgrounds in all different schemes. And he is going to come in, and I really truly believe this. I think this is one of the best things of of you know about him as a candidate. I believe that he will do a full review of the roster that he has and make the decision not based on, oh, I'd like to run a 4-3 or I'd like to run a 3-4, based on the talent that he has on the roster. And if he goes and determines that Rashawn Gary and you know Preston Smith and Kenny Clark and Devontae Wyatt and Quay Walker and all those guys run better in you know a 4-3 or with their hands in the ground at the edge or whatever it might be, he'll do that. And if he thinks that, hey, it just makes sense, they've been running 3-4, they've been running with Rashawn Gary, Preston Smith, LVN, Kingsley and Igbari with them standing up, let's just keep doing that. Then he probably will. So I think he's going to fit what is best for this team and then he'll run his scheme that way, which by the way, is exactly what you want. You don't want, I said this, I don't know how many times throughout the process, you don't want a coach that says, I have to be able to run a 4-3 and my guys have to be on the ground. It could be what you eventually want, but if you don't have the players to run that, then don't run it. So I do think he's going to come in, evaluate what this roster looks like, and then make the best decisions based off of that. It could be 4-3 or hand in the ground. It could be 3-4 and standing up. We will have to wait and see, but I wouldn't make any you know jumps uh, to conclusions right now and say like, yep, he's going to run 4-3. They're going to change things up and LVN and Rashawn Gary are going to have their hand in the dirt. Maybe they will. Maybe they won't. Maybe Preston Smith will be standing up and Kings Landing Barrio will be standing up. And when Rashawn Gary and LVN are in, maybe they'll have their hand in the dirt. Who knows? The world's a mystery. It's a beautiful mystery. And I can't wait to find out what he will do. But you know what I think he will do? What's best for the Packers. And I'm excited to see how he ultimately determines that. One of the key staples of his defense is middle of the field closed. Meaning a very different approach from uh, what Joe Barry was running. Joe Barry, a lot of, you know, cover four, cover two, more middle of the field open looks. Middle of the field close means a lot of single high safety. Last year per PFF at Boston College, 43.1% of his plays were in cover one, meaning single high safety. That was fifth most in the FBS. That is a ton of single high safety. So what does that mean? What does single high safety mean? What are the advantages and disadvantages? Well, the advantages is that you likely have a safety in the box. Guess what that helps with? Closing down all those crossing routes and all those intermediate and short passing routes. Guess what else it helps with? Stopping the run. You've got an extra player in the box. You're taking away all of those little things in the middle of the field and you're able to kind of condense things. So what does that open up? It opens up the deep shots on the left and right side of the field. And you're able to hit some of those, uh, you know, nine routes and you're going one-on-one against corners on the outside. Guess what Green Bay has in theory, in theory to counteract that. Guys who like playing one-on-one on on the outside that have good speed, good length, Carrington Valentine, Eric Stokes, of course, that Jair Alexander guy who can hang on the outside one-on-one. 
it's not something maybe like you're probably looking at 43.1% and thinking that is probably a little bit too much in the NFL, but those are a lot of the sort of defenses that everyone's sort of been clamoring for. Hey, let your corners on the outside do their work and put a single high safety that can roam the back. And hey, if they throw deep to the left, you're going to have a safety that gets over to at least help out. If it's completed, he's going to cut it off for hopefully like a 30, 35 yard gain rather than a 60, 70 yard gain. Or maybe he picks it off if it's a bad throw or if there's a hit on the quarterback. Single high safety also allows you to blitz more. Single high safety also allows you to have more like fake blitzes and just kind of people moving around and, and disguising blitzes. It just puts a lot more people in the box in the vicinity of like, oh, that guy could blitz, that guy could blitz, he could rush. Like, oh, they're like they're stacking the box. And it, it does, it puts a little bit more pressure on your corners. It puts more pressure on your single high safety, but it takes away a lot of that short intermediate stuff, especially in the middle of the field. And and it helps stop the run. So there's definitely advantages. There's definitely disadvantages. He very much enjoys press coverage. Now, as we'll talk to Dusty Evely in just a little bit, it's not like he always did it at Boston College, but in all in likely in large likelihood due to the fact of just the players that he had. That shows good adaptability, by the way. And it does seem like he's going to adapt his defense. But I think Green Bay has the ability to play press and man coverage on the outside. Now, you can't live in that full time. We've talked about this before. If you're just going to run man all the time, teams are just going to run man beaters against you all the time. So you have to be able to vary it. You have to be able to switch it up. And you certainly can't get predictable with any one style of defense. But if you want to have the antithesis of a Joe Barry defense, and I joked around last year of like, hey, Joe, whatever you're doing, do the opposite. And it's probably going to work. It's hard to find a more opposite defense to Joe Barry's defense than what you're getting in this specific Jeff Halfley defense. And we never know quite for sure until he gets to Green Bay and runs his system and we see how he utilizes these players. But everything that we are seeing and everything in his DNA says probably more single high safety, probably more bodies to stop the run, taking away the middle of the field, putting more emphasis on his outside corners to do a lot of the heavy lifting and you know just a... Uh, an ability to dictate terms to the opposing offense. I would be surprised if this ends up anything like death by a thousand paper cuts, bend but don't break, and guys just you know going down the field. There's going to be a little bit more risk involved. And as I said on the live chat once he was hired, hallelujah, sign me up. If they, you know what, if they, if you challenge them to throw deep against Jair Alexander one on one, and they complete a 40 yard bomb down the field, and the guy just beats Jair and, and mosses them or whatever. Be my guest. Tip of the cap. You know what? You earned it. <clears throat> I'd rather have them earn it going, you know, in that situation. And you know what? You got a big play. Congratulations. It probably took a lot to put the exact, you know, um, throw that you needed while well, maybe beating pressure to read the defense, get past Jair. It probably took a, a significant effort to get that done. Tip your cap and we'll go on to the next down. At least it didn't take eight plays and seven minutes off the clock to get that 40 yards. It was just in one fell swoop and it ripped the bandaid. I'm ready for it. I'm so beyond ready for it. I do think this is going to be a very different defense than what we saw with Joe Barry. And if that doesn't give you some hope and optimism in and of itself, I don't know what else will. All right, let's look statistically a little bit. And I think the big season that we need to look at is his season at Ohio State. From a scoring, and he had so one season as a defensive coordinator, co-defensive coordinator actually at Ohio State, but that Buckeyes defense was unreal. Now, he did have some guys like Jeff Okuda and Chase Young and some big time talent on that roster. Jordan Fuller, Damon Arnett, I believe were on that roster as well. So they had some players, no question about it. But that Ohio State defense, fourth in scoring defense, allowing 13.7 points per game. 13.7 points per game. Hallelujah. Total defense, first, 260 yards per game. Pass defense, first, 156 yards per game. Rush defense, eighth, 104 yards per game. It's a pretty freaking good defense. Now, you might say, that's great, Andy. That's Ohio State. Ohio State's always good at defense. Well, funny you say that. Prior to him going to Ohio State, they were 72nd nationally in 2018, uh, or sorry, right before he came. And then in, they went to number one yards in yards allowed per play after that. So they went from 72nd to number one in yards allowed per play once he took over at Ohio State as the co-defensive coordinator. Now, the other co defensive coordinator gets some credit for that as well, as does the entire staff and again, some of those very talented players, but they took a significant jump when he took over as co-defensive coordinator. 
In 2020, at Boston College, his defense moved up 52 spots in total defense. So he has shown the propensity and ability to take over a defense and show legitimate improvement. Now, if you look at Boston College the last couple seasons, defenses haven't been as great. I think talent had a large part to do with that. The transfer protocols and and everything that's changed in, in college football, them getting zapped of some players, there was a lot that was at play there. And no question about it. I think there's probably still some things he would have liked to have done better, but he has shown the ability to take on a big time defense in Ohio State and make it dominant and to improve a defense at Boston College when he took over there. From a player development standpoint, he's coached players like Jeff Okuda, Jordan Fuller, Damon Arnett, Sean Wade, uh, who really took off at Ohio State. Arnett and uh, Okuda ended up as first round picks. Sean Wade, Jordan Fuller both drafted. He worked at, with Darrell Revis when he was at Pitt, Richard Sherman with the 49ers, and a ton of great defensive backs. Richard Sherman had a lot of great things to say about him. More on that in just a little bit, but uh, he's shown some ability for player development. He's shown the ability to coach a high-end defense at Ohio State. He has been a head coach. There are a lot of things on his resume that you should like. How I sort of view this is what has Green Bay sort of been looking for? If you kind of look at their candidates, a little bit more of a young and up and coming candidate. Now, again, he's not like super young. He's in mid forties basically, but a little bit more of a young up and coming candidate, somebody who is going to bring fresh ideas, some fresh energy, a different style of defense, but Of all the known coordinators, there's one new one. We'll get to that. But they did apparently also talk to Wink Martindale about the position. That was one other piece of news on the day. But Martindale and at least of the ones that we know now, Martindale and Staley were the only ones with legitimate defensive coordinator experience, unless you're counting, um, you know, Dirty's uh, defensive coordinator experience in London, which I guess he had that. But for the most part, not a lot of, you know, NFL defensive coordinator experience on the docket. So you are going to be taking a leap of faith with your Christian Parkers and your Denard Wilsons and your Zachary Orrs that they were going to be able to come in and run a defense and call plays and put together a playbook. It's at some point you, you were never, you could never be quite sure because they never did it before. And that is, you're always taking a leap of faith when you hire a new coordinator, but it was even more so with some of those young up and coming uh, ones that just didn't have the same amount of experience. With Halfley, you are getting uh, kind of the best of both worlds. You're still getting a, a young enough coach that's up and coming, and again has this energy and I think a brand you know a brand new style of playing defense for Green Bay. But you have somebody that can also take full autonomy of this defense, who has been a defensive coordinator, who has called plays, who has been a head coach, who has had to make massive decisions for an organization, and now can simply focus on a defense and just taking that aspect of it. And now you have legitimately Rich Basaccia, who's been a head coach, interim uh, that it may be, but been an interim head coach who is completely in charge of the special teams and Matt doesn't have to be as involved with that. You now have a defensive coordinator that can completely take charge of this defensive staff and everything that the defense is doing and doesn't have to get his hands that muddy in the defensive side of things. And then he can focus on offense. He can focus on leading the team and doing all the things that the head coach is required to do on a day-to-day basis and not have to be so stuck in the weeds. And that I think allows Matt to be the best at his job. And I think you now have a defensive coordinator who can really take that and run with it. And you can be excited about it. So you have the head coaching experience, the defensive coordinator experience, and some of those great traits that you were looking for in the Christian Parkers and the Denard Wilsons with maybe just a little bit more of a proven commodity. Not saying it's a guarantee that it's going to work. I'm not saying that he ends up being better than a Bobby Babich or a Denard Wilson or a Christian Parker, some of those guys, but you can at least see the thought process as to why you know, maybe you live somewhere in the middle between if Brandon Staley and Wink Martindale are here and Christian Parker and Denard Wilson are over here from an experience standpoint, you get halfly somewhere in the middle where he's got a good experience, but still has some of those great traits you were looking for from some of the less experienced guys. And it's just, it kind of is a melding of everything all together in one candidate. And I do think that one of the things that really attracted uh, us and when we talked about in the past on Christian Parker was all those different schemes that he came from and he's going to be able to put together the best of kind of all of them. I think it's the same thing here with Halfley. 
I think he is somebody that is going to be able to take the Sala defense, the Petten defense, the Shiano defense, the stuff that he's done, and the stuff maybe that Mike LaFleur, or Matt LaFleur would like to see him do and put it all together and hopefully make this tremendous defense in Green Bay for what it needs to be based on the talent that he has on the roster. So I think that versatility and that experience is going to serve him really, really well. Having that experience with different coaches and different schemes, 3-4, 4-3, everything in between should serve him great. So that being said, I want to take a second now to bring in Dusty Evely so he can talk about some of the scheme stuff that he, you know Halfley did at uh, Boston College, what it means for Green Bay, and then uh, some of Dusty's overall thoughts on the hire. So without further ado, the one and only Dusty Evely. I am now joined by my good friend Dusty Evely. You can find him on Twitter or X at Dusty Evely. Here's the best thing about Dusty. There's a lot of great things about Dusty, but here's the best thing about Dusty. As all of us are frantically searching to figure out every little morsel of information that we can about Jeff Halfley. I go to Dusty's Twitter account, and he, of course, is already breaking down the film from Boston College of what the heck Jeff Halfley did this uh, Halfley, excuse me, did this past season at Boston College. So, Dusty, I had to take a couple minutes of your time just to get your initial reactions and impressions after watching that. But before we get there, first of all, welcome, and second of all. Uh, what were your initial takeaways from when you first found out the news that Jeff Halfley is the new defensive coordinator? So I knew Halfley's name a little bit, mainly because my youngest brother is kind of a sicko. He's he's very into uh, college football recruiting, reads all of that stuff. And I, I he's uh, we, we grew up in Florida is kind of where we started living college football. And so Halfley was kind of big in recruiting circles and coaching circles. And it sounded like I think uh, Florida, Alabama and Georgia were all kind of looking to have him on their staff, either as a coach of some kind, you know, and then, and then kind of head up recruiting and stuff. And so he's the name um, before I even really saw the hire. I was doing something else. My group chat blew up with my younger brother saying, here's who Jeff Halfley is. Uh, so I had that. I mean, initial thought was um, a little surprised just because it wasn't a name that showed up. Right. We've been you as well. Well, probably more so than everyone else has been so ingrained with who were they interviewing, who have they requested interview. We, we did, you know, pack a day yesterday, me and Sarah did, talking about Brandon Staley. Um, I was just talking to Monty Moore, and he he said they were halfway through recording their Zach Orr episode when the news broke. And so we had all these names running through our brains, and they had, you know, Orr and uh, Denard Wilson this week. So we had all these names. Who's it going to be? You start thinking about these guys. You look at their backgrounds. And then out of nowhere is Halfley. I mean, they, they did this, I assume, under cover of night. There was no news about them doing any of the any of the stuff at all. So, I mean, one of my thoughts, initial thoughts was, um, okay, first of all, it's not an interview. I don't know a whole lot about his background. But then once you start reading a little bit more, my thing had always been about the, the guys they were bringing in was you had Staley, who was the LaFleur saying, the side of the, this defense is yours. You take yeah. it, you run with it. Everyone else, if you hired any of those other guys, Christian Parker, Donato Wilson, a lot of that seemed to signal as the floor, I want to take a holistic approach to the team. I want to handle the defense as well. With Halfley, that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. So because of his background, because of coaching DBs and head coach at BC, and he coached a defense coordinator at Ohio State. So it seems to signal to me some of those like, Staley was always kind of the odd man out with that stuff in terms of where it looked like LaFleur was pointing. Um, so I like the idea of LaFleur just being able to hand it off a little bit. Um, and then reading about Halfley's background and where he came up and how highly everyone speaks about him, it's hard not to be excited about, um, I think, about about this as we get into it. It sucks we're not going to be able to see what he does for a little bit. But uh, yeah. I think it's it's I've I've gotten more encouraged, I think, the deeper I've kind of gone down this rabbit hole a bit. I love you going down rabbit holes. You going down rabbit holes is one of my favorite things in the world. Uh, so you did start going down the rabbit hole. I know you're not completely down to the bottom quite yet, but you started watching some Boston College film. What were sort of your key takeaways as you first started to look at it and see some of the fun stuff that he's doing on defense? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, so I need to go back. I wanted to, everyone's been telling me uh, I need to go back to Ohio State 2019 because I was winning the DC, obviously he's head coach at Boston College. And so what I assume is the scheme there, what we're seeing there is is his imprint. That's his idea. Someone else is coordinating. That's his baby. And I like to look at the more modern stuff first, just because it is a what's going on. Like 2019 is forever ago in football terms, in terms of like what guys are running. So I want to see what kind of stuff is he running. 2019 will tell you somewhat, and I'll get into my logic there in a second as far as when I go back there. But what I saw was, that, I mean, the DC defense, uh, the BC defense is one that did not seem to be I want to knock any of these guys not super talented in terms of like overflowing with talent linebackers looked 
fairly slow, limited limited guys up front. The DBs could move a little, but they weren't like they they weren't game changing guys. All the defense, and so trying to view it through that lens in terms of how this stuff is structured, and because I know um, I think they rank 70th in the league in defense or something, and so kind of one of those like how are you how are you excited about a team that ranks 70th in defense? And some of it I think right. was like physical limitation, but if you look at one of the big things I like to look at, or a couple of the big things, is how is communication? I like to look at, especially with him as a DB background, how are these guys passing stuff off on the back end? How are they, what are the, what's a safety rotation look like, first of all? Are they lining too high? Are they lining one high? And then when they pass that stuff off, how are they passing that stuff off? How's the communication? And for the most part, they did it well. Any breakdowns they had, there's a couple breakdowns seem to be communication breakdowns. For the most part, it was physical limitation breakdowns. That someone, someone gets you know, knocked off a route, something like that. That will happen occasionally. But for the most part, you can see these guys communicating beforehand. You can see them communicating afterhand. You can see when the motion's going across, you see hand signals, see those guys like bumping into position. And so the communication seemed really good, which is one, th one thing I always look for. Um, third down blitz package is another, which um, which is fun to say because that was non-existent under Joe Barry. Uh, yeah. But a lot of the stuff they did, again, I think they're limited in what they do. Um, and I, one thing I was looking for was like some of the sim pressure stuff. You know, you, you mug those guys up in the A gap, the, those linebackers. There wasn't a whole lot of that in terms of like the extreme stuff we see out of them. We've seen the Vikings twice a year, right? Like what Flores yeah. does, what Zimmer was doing prior to him is different from what um, from what Halfley's doing. But there is a lot of, I don't know if chaos is the right word. Milling about also seems like a little too bland, but there's a lot of moving pieces up front before the snap in terms of confusion where people are coming from. That's especially true third down. You get a lot of, I've seen a lot of like the four, three versus three, four. I don't want to go down that whole road. A lot of that stuff is going to be sub package anyway. And, and yeah, it, the difference is how you align, but it is a whole lot of two or three down linemen with one guy kind of milling around. But then the third down package stuff is you get linebackers kind of milling around in the box. They'll send some, they'll send some guys. They won't send some guys. They have one of my favorite blitzes is just kind of the delayed through the same gap. And so you blitz a guy through the B gap and you have the other guy kind of loop around and hit directly behind him. So if the running back goes to pick it up, you get some of that stuff on third down. You're mixing up who's dropping from where. So you get the blitzes coming from one side. You have one, it could have been an interception if the D lineman would have seen it a little better where it's, not quite in fire zone because coming from different side of the field, you're plugging a different gap than what you're vacating basically. But you get a lot of kind of like defensive linemen dropping off and replacing. You get a three man rush that looked like a seven man rush, and so you get uh, he's, he was very good at dialing up these free rushers, especially on some of those third down blitz packages. Um, so I mean that, and th th I think a lot of that was again some of the some of that front seven stuff is very interesting because it wasn't. I think my initial response was it's not as aggressive as what I've seen. Again, what we saw from Flores, what uh, McDonald was doing uh, up in Baltimore this year, where it is that kind of aggressive mug and drop. Like it wasn't that, but they did a really good job. I think of of one of the other things. I I don't know how to judge a good coach, right? Aside from like there's some results and you look at the communication stuff. But one of the things I like to look at is communication back end. But I also like to look at um, how long if they're trying to disguise something. Do they hold that disguise? Can they hold that disguise? Uh, and they did a good job doing that for the most part. Again, it's not super aggressive, but they're holding that until the snap, which then creates that doubt in a quarterback's mind. So I think we'll see. I liked a lot of the games they're playing up front. I like that third down blitz package stuff. I liked um, the back end of the defense. Um, they did align, I think this past year, a little more than, than in the past. They aligned in a little more. It's kind of split field, two-man high coverage stuff. But the way they kind of got to that was interesting. Um, and he does play a lot of single high predominantly. But the way they get to some of this stuff is very interesting. And it seemed like it was all it was all pretty sound. Again, communication seemed good. The stuff they're doing made sense. Guys were on the spots they're supposed to be in. Uh, and, and everyone when they had to pass off assignments, they pass it off well. So I think, and again, some of it, of my, and now I want to go back to Ohio State because the Ohio State stuff is then like, I'm looking at this and I saw, I guess my last point is I'm talking a whole lot here, Andy. I apologize. No, do it. There's a whole, what I saw was like, he plays out of press man. There's not, I didn't see a ton of press man. And I think some of that is just due to who he had. But even though it was not press man, um, there was some aggressiveness to it. It's playing off, but they're not playing. It's not eight yards off on third and seven, right? They're playing five or six yards off, squat down, looking to drive down when they can. And I say that, but like they drive down without getting out of position. So they will still be in good position to recover if need be. So even if they're not press man, even if they're not misaligning, because there was early in the season, it seemed like they tried to do a little bit more press man and they weren't very good at it. And so they kind of started pulling those guys off a little bit, which which to me speaks of a couple different things. It speaks of like, it's not, 
we run this no matter what. It is a, my guys can't run this, which means we're going to run something that makes sense for our guys, but we're still going to be playing downhill. We're still going to be playing aggressive. And so I'm curious going back to 2019 Ohio State, which again is like forever ago in football terms. If you've got dudes playing for you, how does that change the picture? Is it still the same system? Does it still look the same, but you're able to do different things just because the dudes you have out there, which obviously translates to who the guys they have in Green Bay and, and what that might look like. But I think just in terms of overall structure, I was impressed. I liked the third down blitz package. I liked the games up front. I liked the way he was kind of moving stuff with alignment and and everyone seemed like they were on the same page, which is, I don't know. It seems like a low bar to clear, but it's a, it's a bar to clear. And it seemed like they did it. So it is a bar to clear. So you're telling me that you're allowed to change your philosophy and your, uh, the way you want to play defense based on the, the, the roster that you have. Uh, listen, I, I understand it sounds like witchcraft. I get it, Andy. I really do. But yeah, at some teams, some guys do like to do that. It's crazy. That's amazing. You mentioned uh, a lot of single high. 43.1% of plays last season per PFF on defense were in cover one. Uh, that's a lot. That was fifth most in the entire FBS. Uh, so that is a, a ton of single high safety. That'll be something that is interesting and obviously a lot different from what Joe Barry did. I think my, my last question for you, and I know, again, you're still kind of digging into this, but one of the things I watched an interview that he just recently did. And one of the things he said, I want to play, you know, a, a lot of middle of the field clothes, a lot of single high safety. Um, but he was very cognizant of the fact that, Hey, this is college football. Uh, you know, the, obviously the, you have the hashes are different. You get some unbalanced stuff. It's a different game. Quarterbacks, sometimes they you know are, are just a little bit more yeah. um, athletic based rather than throwing on the, it's just a different game. So my question for you as best you can is how much of this can, you know, what you saw from Boston College can carry over? And do you think that this could be something that, well, he uses a lot of the stuff that he did at Boston College, he's still going to probably reinvent himself now that he's defensive coordinator of the Packers? Yeah, I think I I think that seems to be in his bones. Like, I think some of that, again, speaks to what he was doing in week one versus, you know, week 10 or something in terms of kind of how he was right. building it around his team. Um, I haven't gotten too deep into – how like if there's any game planning things from from team to team in terms of in terms of what they were doing, but I mean he seems like he seems like a guy who would probably do that again. I'm looking forward to looking at the Ohio State stuff to kind of see how that differed when he had those guys and and by opponent all that stuff. But it did seem like and I'm not not seeing the numbers and not looked at this. I've not charted certainly all of the games from 2023 yet. I will say maybe yet. Um, it seemed like there were games that he was aligning more too high. Than others, like just just based on opponent. I think uh, maybe the SMU game, if I'm not mistaken, seemed to maybe be a little more too high. There's certainly yeah. one or two games in there that seemed a little more too high. So I would say, uh, just just based on what I've seen, it seems like he has he has a base, he has an approach he likes to do, and a lot of that I think starts up front. But he it, he did not strike me when I was watching that going, wow, this is a rigid system. This guy like is only going to run one thing. We'll see what happens, but uh, just just looking at some of those games, I didn't get the feeling that it was like one game plan for each opponent. Which again. You're allowed to do, you are allowed to do that. So adaptability is phenomenal. It's something I think we're all hoping he can bring a little bit more of uh, to Green Bay. Uh, last thing, um, what kind of excited you about the defense when you were watching it or anything that you just kind of like, all right, I'm loving this. And then number two, just any final thoughts uh, on the hire before we get you out of here? I'm really excited about Quay. I think what he was doing with the linebackers um, was was really interesting. Again, some of the, some of the mugging, but not quite mugging, some of the, um, some of the way they would play at the line and then get depth post snap. Uh, and so I was joking with someone earlier. I swear to God, one of those linebackers was 290 pounds. Like it's, they were not, they were not working with like, you know, cream of the crop linebackers there at all positions. So I'd say, but some of the depth they want to get post snap, it reminded me a lot of what, uh, what the Niners like to do with, the, if you watch that team and how they like to get depth with the linebackers, take away the middle of the field, play downhill with those guys while still creating chaos up front it seemed like he's got that in his bones in terms of what he wants to do. And it, you, it's hard to look at that and not think like, boy, Quay's going to be really good at this. So I think some of the third down blitz stuff, uh, creating confusion up front, creating those one-on-ones, and then you know seeing who's who's going to blitz and creating some confusion there and the depth that they get with those linebackers. Uh, those are the things that really, I think, more than anything, I think each game I was watching going, but Quay, Quay, if Quay hits with some of the flashes he hit this past year in this system, this seems like this could be a system that could be very, very good for him in the middle of the field. So I'm really excited about that. And what yeah, was the I other question? It. I missed it, Andy. Oh, just your, any final thoughts, uh, like overall on the on the hire? 
no, I'm just, I'm, I'm again, I'm, I'm excited. I'm optimistic by nature. You know that about me. So I'm, I look for the good. I know there's, there's going to be some bad as well, but I'm, uh, my, my only bad at the moment is that we don't get to see it right away, that we have to wait a little bit, but I'm, I was, I was knee deep in going into uh, Staley. And then I was looking at the Ravens defense because I thought it was going to be Wilson. Now the back of my head is going to be Wilson. So shifting, I mean, you can never be sure when you go from college to the pros, but I think as watching this, just going, you can see some of these guys translating. You, you can replace like that slow D end with Rashawn Gary. And you can just say like, okay, what does this look like if you get some of those guys? And I'm, I'm not hyped, hyped, hyped um, because I've been burned for the past three years. And so we'll see what happens on that front. But uh, the more I watch it, the more I watch, the more I read, the, the more uh, hopeful I am about what this defense is going to look like next year. I'll trust the defense when they give me reason to trust the defense. I'll yeah. be excited about the defense once I am uh, have the ability to be excited about the defense. But I'm overly optimistic with you about the hire. I can't wait to see it in action. The best cameos in the world are Dusty Evely cameos. Dusty, thank you so much for joining me for a couple of minutes uh, to chat about Jeff Halfley and this new defense. Uh, tell all the good people where they can find you really quick. I, on Twitter, at Dusty Evely. I'm, I'm a little quiet during uh, the offseason here. I'll resurface at some point, but I'll shout about whatever I'm working on over at Dusty Evely, I'm sure. You know he's doing a deep dive somewhere, and it's the best stuff in the world. Make sure to go give him a follow. Appreciate you a ton, Dusty. Thanks, Eddie. Appreciate you, brother. All right, so that was Dusty Evely. A huge thank you to Dusty for hopping on on short notice and giving us 15 minutes of his time. Like I said, he jumped right into Boston College tape, so I wanted to get his uh, take on it and pick his brain as much as I could. Uh, you, of course, can follow him at Dusty Evely uh, on Twitter or X. Make sure to do that. He's the absolute best. So, Dusty, appreciate you a ton. All right, so let's jump into what people have said uh, about Jeff Halfley and uh, some of the best quotes that, and just other miscellaneous information that I found. So first of all, this was from Bill Huber's article, which just cracked me up. So he got quotes from two anonymous scouts. And to be fair, like scouts are an interesting breed. Some of the stuff that they say about players and coaches and GMs, they're all over the place. Like never really trust a anonymous scout ever. They are, it's just the most bizarre stuff you will ever see from time to time. Um, like there's stuff that they say, like, I think that most of those guys are probably great at like scouting individual players, but man, some of their thoughts on like the overarching stuff in the NFL that you will see in like McGinn's articles when he gets all these, you know, quotes from scouts, it is off the wall sometimes, but these were the two quotes from two different NFL scouts again, per Bill Huber. One, he's a really good defensive coach. Don't let his track record at Boston college fool you. That was number one. Number two, man, not a good choice. Those were the two anonymous quotes. And then just, and Huber responded back to me when I uh, tweeted back at him of how amazing those quotes were. And he's like, just like anything else, nobody knows anything. And it was just great. But I talk about the duality of, of you know, scouting and what people think of a, a coach or a player. Everyone, of course, is all over the place. Nobody freaking knows. We're all just spinning around this globe, not knowing anything, especially when it comes to football. Uh, Dan Orlovsky says, heck of a football coach. Packers defense will be much much more aggressive. Richard Sherman, this was a quote from when they were together in San Francisco. Quote, his preparation is some of the best I've seen. I've had some great defensive back coaches, some great defensive coaches and defensive minds, and he's right up there with his preparation and how he breaks down film and how easy and simple he makes the game plan sound and how easy he makes it for guys to understand. He paints a very vivid picture of what you're going to see, and it's all about executing. And then recently, after he found out that he's going to be the defensive coordinator in Green Bay, he said, quote, he's going to be a great fit. Per Eric Eager, who is, of course, a like data analyst, he used to work for PFF, he said, quote, one of the first things that Jeff Halfley did when he got the Boston College job was stop by the offices in Cincinnati to see how he could help his staff better prepare for games using data. If you're somebody who likes the analytical side of things, this is a great sign. We talked about with Brandon Staley, how he is extremely far into the analytics. How far you want to go with that is a little bit of a choose your own adventure and your mileage may vary, but you want your coaches to have some level of analytics. And Green Bay has ramped up their analytics team with their staff on the Packers. So he's going to have the, a team of analytics experts right on the staff, and he clearly wants to use that type of data. That is a huge win, in my opinion. Mitchell Wolf. Staff writer for the Boston College Eagle Insider said, quote, nobody loves single high and middle of the field close coverages more than half. Pretty aggressive with blitzing, mostly a 4-3 even front guy, but has some more diverse stuff in his bag. He loves man coverage. I will say it once again. 
you cannot get further away from Joe Barry and his style of defense than what this is. He likes zone. He likes man. He likes middle of the field open. He likes middle of the field closed. He doesn't like blitzing. He likes blitzing. He doesn't like press. He likes press. It is night and day different. And I think, like I said earlier, you should all probably be pretty excited about all of that. All right, so let's talk about a couple of the other talking points that have come up with him taking on the defensive coordinator job. The One of the talking points is, well, why would you leave uh, Boston College as a head coach to become a defensive coordinator for the Packers? And did you know that he's on shaky ground at Boston College? If he didn't perform well this year, he was probably getting fired. Well, the second part of that might answer a little bit of the first part. There's a, a lot of great interviews. I retweeted one of them, but the first thing, this is before he took the head coaching job, obviously. There is a great interview with him and he's basically saying how much he loves coaching defense and how much the game of college football has changed. If you have not been following college football, the game of college football has changed drastically. The job of a head coach is quite frankly, a nightmare. It is a nightmare. It is not about coaching football anymore. It is not about mentoring athletes. It is about fundraising so that you have enough money so that you can pay players. It is about the transfer protocols. It is about making sure that when you actually develop a player, they're now not leaving to another bigger college, like a Jordan Addison going from Pitt to USC. Like These are all the things that you now have to worry about, and it's a totally different landscape. Coaches are leaving all over the place. They're going from one school to another. There's no loyalty anywhere. There's It is a mess. It is a mess, and you are going to see a lot more coaches leave from college and go to the NFL. The time consumption that a head coach in college has right now, it is unbelievable. Like It is just zapping the life stream out of their entire body. That's how crazy it is. So you are going to see more of this, and I have zero concern that he was ready to leave college football. In fact, I think this is the perfect job for Jeff Halfley. I think him not having quite as much on his plate. One of the things he said in his interview is like, I miss coaching defense. I miss coaching defensive backs. Like he's like, I want to get my hands dirty and all that stuff. But he's like, I got to go on the recruiting path and I've got to you know do fundraisers and I've got to get on a plane to talk to this kid. I got to talk to these other kids to make sure that they stay and don't go to other colleges. And it's just like, everything has to you know be managed and he doesn't get to do the stuff that he loves. And the stuff that he loves is coaching defense. And that's what he's going to be doing in Green Bay. And instead of being pulled in a million different directions, he is now the CEO of the Packers defense and can focus solely on that. And I think he is just going to be honed in and zoned in and so happy to be doing that. I have zero issue with him leaving Boston College. I have zero issue with him being on shaky ground as a head coach. Boston College is a tough job. And, you know, he had decent success there, you know, some decent seasons, the talent that you're going to get at Boston college right now with the changing landscape of college football is really, really tough. I've, I don't care at all. I think you go back to his defensive days at Ohio state and that season and what he's done as a defensive backs coach in the NFL, that would guide me more. Plus I love the fact that he has had coaching experience. I think that is a value add, not anything that takes away. So no issues with that. The next talking point that came up was Well, and the initial report was, it sounds like Green Bay is going to be keeping their defensive coaches on staff and many, if not all, um, and that's who's, you know, Halfley's going to have to work with. Well, per Tom Silverstein in his most recent article said, uh, Halfley's hiring will likely mean some changes on the defensive staff. LaFleur has told the assistants they are free to explore other options, but he probably will have to sit down with Halfley and find out how many coaches he wants to bring in from the outside. So per Spoon, it sounds like Matt is open to Halfley bringing in his own guys. Now, he's worked with Ryan Downard in the past, so it would make sense, logically, of you probably just keep Ryan Downard on staff. Now, he maybe doesn't have to, maybe doesn't want to, who knows what that connection is, but there could be clear and obvious synergies between some of the people who are already on staff and what Jeff Halfley wants to do. If not, it sounds like, per Spoon, that they will potentially have the option to maybe move on from some player or from uh, staff members and maybe have Halfley bring in some of his own guys. I don't have a huge thought process on this one way or the other. I do think if you're making somebody the CEO of the defense, that they should be able to hire their own guys. I don't think you say, hey, you get full command, except I get to hire all of your staff members. It doesn't make sense. But I think if there are logical coaches that make sense to keep and Halfley's cool with it and thinks that that works well, then by all means, then do that. But if there's potential issues where 
you know, one outside linebackers coach is maybe well versed in three, four, uh, you know, guys standing up and now you're going to run guys with hands in the dirt and the, just the, it doesn't match up, then you change it. But it does sound like Matt is open to changing if there needs to be change. And we're just going to have to wait and see to see how that plays out. And if there are actually any different changes on the defensive side of the ball from a coaching standpoint. Another thing that I want to talk about here is with him playing more single high safety, this changes the importance of the safeties drastically. Cover two, or like keeping your safeties deep, I'm not saying it's easy. It's not. And you do have to have a skill set where you can come up and tackle and take aggressive angles and, and the right angles and, and, and be a good tackler in the open field. Number one, Green Bay wasn't great at that anyways. But I will argue that when you're playing your safeties deep, that's the easiest version of safety to play. You don't necessarily need the big time safeties because you're just taking away your area of the field. You don't have to have the sideline to sideline ability that you're playing single high and you have to be able to get to both sidelines. You just have your half. So it doesn't necessarily mean speed is quite as important. You maybe don't have to have the, like, you're not maybe changing up your looks pre and post snap quite as much between the guy who's playing in and the guy who's playing deep. You may not have to scream back from, you know, if, if you're a, a say, or, um, the safety that's down in the box to go play your side of the field, there's just a little less responsibility. You're probably not playing as much man coverage in the too high safety look. There's just a lot of different things where I think that's the easiest version of safety to play. And you can probably get along with marginal players a little bit more. With the single safety look, if they are going to play more of that, the single high safety is going to have to be somebody that probably is just not on this roster, or at least wasn't last year. And they're going to probably have to go shopping for that player, whether that be an early draft pick or whether that be a big time free agent signing. That is going to become a much, much more important piece. Now the box safety, those guys you can find a little bit more that I'd be less concerned about. I think you can find somebody who could play that role. Um, that I, I, you know, I'm not saying that's easy either, but I think you can find that. But I do think the, the player that you intend on playing that single high safety is going to have to be a big upgrade from anything the Packers had in that safety room last season. So keep an eye on that. I do think that position is becoming much more important. The good news, there's a lot of really good free agent safeties and Green Bay should, and I think will be looking at those. The draft, unfortunately, Daniel Jeremiah, no safeties in his top 50 on his initial draft board. That's not a great sign for needing more safeties, but the free agency class is pretty solid from a safety standpoint. Another talking point. Well, this is on Matt LaFleur. And if he doesn't, if he screws this one up, if Jeff Halfley's not good, he's fired. Fire that guy. Okay. All right. First of all, Jeff Halfley hasn't even had a day on the job yet. We don't know what he's going to bring to the table. There's a, a lot of situations where Halfley is fine. Probably not bad. Probably not great. He's just fine. He's the 16th best defense. And is that a fireable offense? No, no, it's not a fireable offense. Here's the thing. Judge Matt LaFleur ultimately on what he does to lead this team to success and how he is handling Jordan Love in this offense. The worst thing that you can do is say, well, if the defense doesn't pick it up or turn it around, fire Matt LaFleur. You know, it means he probably made another bad hire. And you will have to, if, if he does stick around and the offense continues to be amazing and they continue to have playoff seasons, you're probably not firing Matt, nor should you probably fire Matt. But you probably need to have a conversation with them on who he's hiring as defensive coordinator, and you probably need a different process. But no, I don't necessarily think if Jeff Halfley fails and everything else goes right, maybe Rich Passaccia and the special team steps up and the offense continues to be amazing. Just moving on from Matt because he picked the wrong defensive coordinator, I think is the wrong move. But this is a very important hire for Matt. Let's hope he got it right. It's going to just take time to play out. But no, I don't think that uh, Matt's entire regime is based upon if he got this hire right or not. You know, who knows? It's, just, it's so incredibly hard to say, but um, but I do think there's avenues and ways where Matt could be amazing at everything else and the defensive coordinator hire just doesn't go right and he gets to hire another one. And the next one will be very important then. But I do know how important this is. His coordinator hires have not been great. It's been one of the weakest aspects of his entire regime. And this needs to be a big hire for him. So I agree that this is a massive hire. I don't think we're anywhere near needing to make a, a referendum on Matt LaFleur based on this one hire yet. So I'm not willing to go quite that far. Some final thoughts on this move. Guys, I legitimately think that this is a good hire. I really do. This is not rose tinted glasses. This is not me being just optimistic Andy. I legitimately think this is a good hire. 
let's go back. And you might say, well, what are you basing that on? Let's go back. I did, before I did my deep dives on any of the, the coordinators, I did my traits episode and my, my wish list, what I would like to see from this defensive coordinator. So these were my 12 things that I put on this list. Number one, a teacher. We heard a couple of those different quotes of how good of a teacher and how great he is at, at explaining things and making things simplified for the players. All right. It seems like he has a really good, you know, great ability to teach his players. Number two, communicator and connector. Same thing. Richard Sherman, great example of how he's a great communicator and connector, seems to bring people together, has the head coaching experience to bring a team together. So to me, that is a check. Number three, leadership and buy-in. Now, from a buy-in standpoint, we're going to have to wait and see. How does he get his players to buy in? But when he went to Ohio State, one season in, first year as a co-defensive coordinator, got all of his players to buy in. When he got to uh, Boston College, got his players to buy in. And from a leadership standpoint, one of the top things that shows leadership ability is head coaching ability. The fact that you had to lead an entire team and he has that. You know, it's going to be one of those things that we're going to have to wait and see a little bit, but I would mostly check that at least from a resume standpoint. Number four, build an identity. We've already talked about he has a specific identity. Now he has to get, again, his players to buy into that and he has to merge the players that he has on this team with the system that he wants to have, but he has a more you know, again, single high safety, aggressive attacking, stopping the run, putting your corners on an island a little bit more uh, mentality. And he has an identity on defense. He is going to dictate to you. That is a step in the right direction, in my opinion. Number five, adaptability and the ability to put players in best positions. We heard Dusty talk about it. He didn't have the talent at Boston College at outside corner to run a lot of press man stuff. I'm sure he would have loved to. He didn't have the players to do it. Guess what? He had to adapt. He had to put his players in the best positions possible to succeed. Richard Sherman talked about how he's always putting his players in position to succeed. We know that he's worked with multiple defensive schemes. I very much think he's going to be adaptable. So that to me is a check mark. Number six on my list was analytical skills. What did we just talk about with Eric Eager? One of the first things he did at Boston College was go seek out data analysts and data scientists to say, what can I do to give my team the best advantage at Boston College? Very analytically driven. Number seven, hungry to prove themselves. Now this is interesting, but I would argue that, you know, and you might say, well, he's taking a demotion going from head coach to defensive coordinator. I think he wants to be the best defensive coach in the world. I think he loves coaching defense. And I think this is his calling. I don't think head coach is his calling. Even based on that interview that I listened to, you could tell, I think he just, it was not what he was expecting. And I could tell he loved coaching defense and wanted to get back to coaching defense. And I think he is driven, like I said, to be the best defensive coach that he can be. Not necessarily the best head coach, but I do think he's driven. I really, really do. So I would check that one off as well. Number eight, uh, can you get the defense playing cohesively? Dusty Evely talked about it. The great communication uh, on the back end, you know, players being able to hold their blitzes until the last minute. That is cohesive football. That's all being on the same page. And again, per Dusty and what he saw in film, those things were there. Those traits were there. Number nine, ability to run the defense autonomously. And this were some of the questions that we had with the Christian Parkers and the Denard Wilsons. Would they be able to come in and just run it, not having that experience? He's an experienced head coach and a defensive coordinator who's done all the things that you need to do. I think you're going to be able to give him uh, complete control of this defense and have him be the CEO of that defense. That to me is a check. Number 10, synergy with Matt LaFleur and the coaching staff. Now we know again, they're not best friends, but it does seem like they've had some connections through coaching circles. I'm sure he vetted it with his brother who worked with them, with Adam Stenovich who worked with them, with Ryan Downard who worked with them. And it sounds like he's going to be able to put together maybe some of his own staff as well. So that to me, it looks like already there is a synergy there and it sounds like they're probably going to be on the same page pretty much from day one. Number 11, a team first mentality. Go listen to some of the videos on how he coached the team. Trust me, this is a coach with a team first mentality. He's not looking to get promoted. I don't think he wants to be a head coach. He's not, he is not in this for him. He's in this to make the Packers the best team that they can be in this defense, the best that they can possibly be. I don't think he's looking to go anywhere else. I think this is kind of a dream job for him. There was a report that he has been, uh, you know, he loves the, the Green Bay tradition and has, you know, in the past really looked upon the Packers fondly. I think him getting to coach one of the greatest franchises in the world and be what he wants to be a defensive coach. I think this is it. And I think he's going to put the team first. I don't think he's worried about his future as a coach. I think this is a team first mentality. And then number 12, play calling scheme and playbook. He's done play calling. 
He's put together a scheme at Ohio State, although with a co-defensive coordinator, but he's put together a scheme at Boston College as well, and he's got a playbook put together. He checked every single one of my boxes that I put out there prior to even knowing who this guy was. So I legitimately, I'll say it one more time, I believe that this is a legitimately good hire based on the resume, based on listening to him talk, based on uh, you know everything that I've read about him, everything that I've seen. I'm excited. What Dusty said about what he saw on, on the Boston College tape, I think this is a legitimately good hire. How I would have ranked him, um, I probably would have ranked him in a similar category. I think I liked Bobby Babich a little bit more. I think I liked Christian Parker a little bit more. I think I liked Denard Wilson a little bit more. You know what that means? Absolutely nothing. I liked him more than Staley. I liked him more than, uh, or, uh, um, you know, uh, Dirty. I liked him more than, um, who is the other one? Or Zach Orr. You know what that means? Absolutely nothing. It means nothing. I don't mean to be like, hey, we're all, you know, just idiots here or whatever, but like, it is so hard to tell how, uh, you know, defensive coach who's had some experience, but not a ton is going to come in from college to the NFL, run a defense with the players that he has on the roster, with players that we don't even know are going to make up this roster yet. We don't know what the safety room is going to look like, the corner room. We don't know We don't know a lot about this team. When Enigbari is going to get back, if they're going to release Devondre Campbell, we don't know so much. So I'm excited to see what this hire gives me is hope. And if I had to say one thing that I was really hoping for going into this entire process was hope. When, you know, Brandon Staley would have given me a lot of cause for concern. He would have given me some hope, but there would also have been like some anxiety. Staley would have given me hope plus anxiety. Uh, you know, the the two, you know, younger, I, I guess we'll say uh, Zach Orr and, um, you know, the, the, the Cowboys guy, uh, Dirty, they both would have given me a little bit more anxiety with a little bit of hope. The three guys I mentioned earlier, Babich, Christian Parker, Denard Wilson, they all would have given me hope. This is a coach that gives me hope. Now, I don't trust anything for a Packers defense until I see it. I have no idea what we're going to see from this defense until we actually see it in action. I'll believe the defense is actually good when they actually become good consistently, but this hire has given me hope and I'm excited to see what he's going to ultimately bring to the table and be as the new defensive coordinator of the Green Bay Packers. Uh, as I mentioned, one other news and notes, uh, they did apparently talk to Wink Martindale for the position as well. So that brings the total known interview candidates up to eight. And again, two experienced ones in Brandon Staley and Wink Martindale. Interesting process. Some experienced candidates, some less experienced candidates. Like I said, it's interesting to me that Halfley kind of falls somewhere in the middle there. And I kind of like that a lot. Denard Wilson, meanwhile, did get the defensive coordinator job with the Tennessee Titans. He was highly sought after. I thought maybe he would get one of the jobs with the Seahawks now that McDonald is there or with the Ravens now that that spot is open, but he officially gets the Tennessee Titans defensive coordinator job. Then the last thing is, how do you feel about the hire? Are you excited? Are you nervous? Are you anxious? Are you hopeful? What adjective would you use? Put it in the chat below if you're on YouTube. I would love to hear about it. And I'm excited to hear all of your thoughts. Also, let me know, did our conversation today, did it change your mind? Did it make you more excited? Did it make you more nervous? I'd love to know how you feel after learning a little bit more about Jeff Halfley. For one, I am excited. I'm excited to see what he can bring to the table. I think it was a legitimately good hire, one that came out of absolutely nowhere. But the more I dug in, the more that I liked And I do think that he's going to be a new set of eyes and a new set of fresh ideas for this Packers defense, which is exactly what they needed. Shout out to our Hall of Fame and All-Pro members, Most Hated Minnesotan, PJ Wynn, John Wilde, Jay Bradad, Brandon Pilata, Jennifer Wright, Boom Handle, Donald Lee, Lori Lord, Baby QB, and David McCluskey. I will see you guys right back here tomorrow. But until next time, and as always, Go Pack Go!